All right, <clears throat> we're back with 999 part 18. Just got out of all of the room four stuff. Stepped into a hallway that looked rather familiar. Metal grate, let's check the map. Let's go. Sorry, my mind all of a sudden left me even though I just stopped and started recording again. <clears throat> um. Lol, real mad. All right, and that's the, I don't remember symbol. Something about Hermes though. <laughs> I'm wondering where it's going to start getting into territory that I don't recognize. Let's try these doors. Of course, they're not going to open. They need the red. Wait, the reds aren't working. What the fuck? And then Snake comes to show the solution. So, this is like a giant hospital ship. A gigantic. So there's three possible ships. The Titanic, the Olympic, and the Gigantic. This is the most likely ship, is the Gigantic. A giant hospital liner used for World War II. Or modded for World War II or something like that. Six hours. Let's go check the rooms. <clears throat> Into the room. Everyone's all like, what the fuck? They're already in there. Where the fuck is Snake? It's just... Anyway. It's not like things are really going to change much. We should go check out the hallway with all the rooms. Okay. Aside from taking slightly longer to click through the thing, turned ran down the hallway to the left. And now we've already seen this. Let Ace handle it. And back to large hospital room. <clears throat> Walk away without saying anything. Let's finish searching. They looked everywhere they could think of, but Snake was nowhere to be found. Lotus looked around at six frustrated faces and spoke. We can't keep looking for Snake. Wherever he is, he's not here. We need to get moving. Junpei couldn't disagree with what she was saying. Snake seemed to have completely disappeared. There was no point to wasting any more time. So let's go and proposal for uh, teams of people that... Uh, leaving three people with two teams of four... four two teams of four and three... She was right. This, there's no consequence for this. It wasn't pleasant, but she was right. It wasn't any way that the numbers worked out. If one group was four, the other group would always have a digital root that didn't match a door. Yeah. Greatest amount of happiness to the greatest amount of people. ba ga da ba ga da ba Just, there's no real other options, so... Just gotta do it. Oh, hey, Ace is volunteering to do it to himself. So, just leave, and now let me inject myself with some sedative so that I can't be disputed with. Some kind of pharmaceutical drug or something. There was a little pitch to the sound of the soporyl beta. Soporyl beta? Junpei had no idea what the meant or my kind of medicine might be. Anesthetic, so. Just leave and I'll go to sleep. I need a nap and whatnot. Mm, peace. Let's, okay, for this one, I'd like to go through door 8, but according to this thing over on the notepad, I have to go through door 7 for this thing. I. I think I'm gonna go, go with door seven. Okay, seven it is. Yeah. All right, then that means June's gotta go through eight. What? Why? What? Or, or what, why? What? Santa grimaced and muttered angrily to himself, but finally began to explain. If six of us are gonna keep going without leaving anyone behind, then... 
plan A, 70358, 8, Let's review all these plans. I don't know why. Okay. That's how that works. In other words, 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 can never go through the same doors. You get it now? Santa finished. June looked over at Junpei. Tears welling up in the corner of her eyes. Oh no. They're saying we're not going to see each other again for a long time. Junpei felt just as June did. He wanted to be at her side through whatever trials they were preparing to face. But, Balagdaba, let's just go and do this. Things will be fine. They stood in front of the door. Seven took a deep breath. You guys ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go. Such varied voices necessary for the both of them. The door had opened. A narrow hallway stretched out before them. Seven and Clover leapt through the door. The moment they did, their bracelets beeped. The detonators in their bracelets had been activated. Junpei stepped forward to follow them, but looked to his right towards eight. Their eyes met. They nodded. Their farewell took almost 1.5 seconds. Then someone took hold of Junpei's arms and hauled him bodily through the door. Get a fucking move on! It's right there, though, so fortunately. Beep, beep, beep. Okay. Sitting in this chair is uncomfortable, or sitting at the computer is uncomfortable now because part of my desk came off. Anyway, let's just, you know, stop fighting and do this. It's not a corpse. It's a doll, don't fucking worry. Medical doll. See you out. All right. Or scalpel, I mean. I think I'm supposed to combine that with the knife. And organ key. Organ trail. Let's go this way. Medical record. I forgot if I mentioned this the first time, but this has the excuse me. This has the weight of all of the body parts and whatnot. This way. Awesome, it's unlocked. No, I won't. I might say what it is on the label, but there could be anything in there. There's a note on top of the table. Iron 1, salt 2, water 3, carbon dioxide, huh? Ammonia, huh? Ethanol, huh? What do you think is the hint? this is a hint for? Maybe it's got something to do with this box. Okay. Iron, salt, and water are one, two, and three. One. Seven. I think that's nine. Ethanol, I think it's nine. Okay. Carbon dioxide. I think it's nine three. Dioxide is three. I think it's just based on the number of whatever atom or thing. Ammonia, so three four nine. Whatever I 
Oh yeah, three, four, nine. There we go. That was just the number of atoms or what whatnot on each one of them. God, and there's so much body part here. I think we should go back. Stuff cleared up his brain, made him remember some stuff. Not a factory. Um I had another story kinda like that one. One in the freezer. What the freezer? Something about glycerin. Hold on, what were they talking about? Let me just go up. Oh yeah, EDT crystals that hadn't crystallized, but then when it had the first day, happened the first day, it spread, just like glycerin. When Junpei was done, Seven looked thoughtful and absent-mindedly rubbed the scar on his chin. As it doesn't melt at room temperature. Okay. The key here, this is another thing that actually matters for the thing, is not to be nondescript about it, but be, but to say, know about Ice Nine. Do you? Know about Ice Nine? Ice Nine? Ice Nine, Ice Nine. Ice, Ice, Ice. Suddenly, Seven's eyes shut open. That's it! I remember now! That woman, she's on this boat! That woman? Alice! Who's Alice? Come on, the woman who won't melt at room temperature! Huh? It became clear to Seven that Junpei had no idea what he was talking about. He ran his hand across his face and took a deep breath. You know how the Titanic sank on April 15th, 1912, right? Yeah. More than 1,500 people died. Worst maritime accident in history. What about it? Did you hear about the boat that was sent to collect the dead bodies? Uh, I think that was the RMS Carpathia, right? It was a cruise liner just like the Titanic. <clears throat> no. That was the ship that picked up the survivors. The ship that collected the dead bodies was the CS... Me the CS McKay Bennett. The McKay Bennett showed up on April 17th, two days after the accident. It set out from Halifax, a port in Canada, and recovered 306 bodies. The Atlantic w that far north was really cold. It would have to be for there to be icebergs and stuff. Anyway, the bodies they pulled out of the water were frozen solid. This isn't a very nice story. So, what happened next? Well, they say the McKay Bennett recovered something more than just dead, dead bodies. There were various bits of stuff floating around in the water. Things the drowned had carried with them or stuff dislodged as the ship sank. One of the things they found was a coffin. A coffin? Yeah, a wooden one. The craftsman who... I don't want to say this in his voice. It's getting strenuous again. Before, when I was doing it, I, the cold was for some reason worse and making it easier to do his voice. <sighs> the craftsman who... I'll just do a lower voice. The craftsman who made it must have been pretty skilled. It wasn't just a wooden coffin. It was all wood. There was no nails or reinforcements, and there were no gaps in the wood anywhere. It was airtight. The crew got pretty curious about what might be inside and opened it up. They had to get a wedge and hammer it open. It was so well made. Inside, they found a woman. Or I guess you could say, should say they found the de dead body of a woman. Her hair was thick and black, and her skin was deep brown and didn't show any signs of age or decom decomposition. They say that she looked gorgeous, like a goddess. She was obviously dead, but everyone who looked at her said she looked just like she was sleeping. Her skin was so lifelike she looked like she might wake up in any minute. She didn't, though. Like the rest of the bodies they found, she was frozen solid. Eventually, the McKay Bennett finished the search and returned to Halifax. The 306 dead bodies were unloaded and not taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to melt. They say that the stink was horrible. But there was one body that didn't thaw. The girl in the coffin. That's right. Every, everybody thought for sure that she'd melt and start to rot like the rest of them eventually. But weeks passed and nothing happened. Then a month passed and nothing... Er, and another, and it was summer and she was still frozen solid. After a while, people started to say she was some sort of miracle. Rumors about the girl started to spread, and people came to Halifax from all over. After a while, people started to call her All Ice, Alice. Of course, those rumors didn't last long. Why? Well, she up and disappeared. One day Alice was there, and the next day she wasn't. 
They say someone snuck into where they were keeping her and stole the body. With the body gone, the rumors followed pretty quickly. And after a while, no one remembered her. You might be able to find something about her if you could find a newspaper from back then, but that's about it. Wait, you just said that she was on this boat. Yeah, I did. Alice has got to be somewhere on this ship. Now why the hell would you say something like that? Because I know. And just what is it that you know? What happened to Alice after she was stolen? Junpei gulped. Alright, tell me. What happened to Alice? Seven nodded and s slowly and took on the look of a man recalling something long buried. Well, around that time, the word was that there was a thriving black market in New York. I mean, I'm sure there still is, but that was special. Or, but this was special. All millionaires from all over the world. I've heard that Alice went up for auction there. The person who won the auction was Lord Dashiell Gordain. You've heard that name before, right? Sir Gordain. Isn't he the guy who bought the Gigantic? The Titanic sister ship? Or the Titanic sister ship? Yeah, that's him. Sometimes I don't get the, like, things. Like, it should, seems like that should have been a question mark after that, but it was a period. I don't know, unless I phrased it like, the Titanic sister ship. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, that's him. Although I guess he hadn't done that yet. What do you mean? Gordain bought Alice in 1912. Then four years later, in 1916, he bought the Gigantic. And he hid Alice somewhere on the Gigantic. But nobody knows where. He died in 1931. And apparently he died without ever telling anyone where Alice was hidden. However... However... What? Well, he did have one close friend who asked him, Where is Alice? Where is Alice? And he said, Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the Forest of Knowledge, beneath the navel of the Gigantic. What the hell is that? Some kind of riddle? Your guess is as good as mine. Seven threw his hands up in defeat. So that's it. Whatever you think... Or... Whatever you think, I believe it. She's hidden somewhere on the Gigantic. In other words, she's hidden somewhere on this ship. Hmm... Before Junpei could dispute Seven's rather bizarre claim, they heard Clover's voice from the door. She did not sound pleased. Hey, what are you two doing over there? Stop wasting time and get over here. Okay, okay, we're coming. Ah. Seven looked at Junpei. Yeah, so anyway, that's the story. It might be useful someday. Don't forget it. With that cryptic remark, he turned and left the room. Junpei was left behind to ponder what he'd just heard. He tried to remember what Jun had told him earlier. The mummy wasn't just a normal mummy. <clears throat> they say that she was frozen. The story says that from the time of its discovery all the way through when it got put on the Titanic, and even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. Was that Egyptian priestess Alice? Had the water in her body become Ice Nine? No, that's nuts. There's no way somebody like that could exist. Junpei shook his head, trying desperately to clear it, and followed Seven to the operating room where Clover was waiting. <coughs> ah. Sorry. I wonder if I can fuck myself over. Uh, oh. Leg. Leg. Stomach. so maybe it's the wrong way and swap body parts with John's all right and now we've got to do this not that 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 there we go hey Junpei I just heard something came from John's operating table let's go check out what happened on John's table 
Look at the scale. Huh? The lid on the scale. Oh, I get it. Must have opened because it matched Sean's weight to what's on the chart. Okay. Jupiter key, yeah. Hey, hold on. Who's about to put it in? Where's Clover? Huh? Junpei turned around. Clover was no. I like how this is basically all the stuff that I already did in the first playthrough so far. Except a lot faster. God damn it, where the hell did she go? Uh, okay, just hold on a minute. I'll go get her. Sure thing. Junpei left Seven at the door and headed back to the operating room. Fuck, this is all this stuff, except I didn't go through the right third room. God damn it. Fuck, I did this in the first time I played through this game. Like, the actual first time, too. Apparently. She was staring at the mannequin. And then the last story thing that we need to do here is to give her the four-leaf clover. So literally, already all the stuff that I did the first time I played through this game. But I need to go through room one instead. Reached into the pocket and dug it out. A four-leaf clover. Santa had given it to him in the second classroom. He held it out to Clover. Did you know that each leaf on a four-leaf clover means something? Hope, faith, love, and luck. Take it. Use it as a good luck charm. He pressed the four-leaf clover into her hand. Listen to me, Clover. No matter what happens, you can never lose hope. You have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith and to have love. If you can remember all of those, that'll bring you good luck. Snake... I, I mean, your brother. He's not dead. He's alive, somewhere. I'm sure of it. You just gotta believe in that. Clover stared at the four-leaf clover in her hand. He could see his tears start to form at the corners of her eyes. Thank you. Her voice was tiny and broken as she spoke, and start, she started to cry. And as she spoke, she started to cry. She tried to hide her tears by looking at the floor, but it did a little good. She wiped away tears with the, bag, the baggy arms of her jacket, but more, qui but more quickly took their place. No matter how she tried, she couldn't stop crying. Her tears made small wet circles on the floor. Thank you, she said it again. Then she looked up at Junpei and seemed to choke down the last of her grief. She did her best to smile. Junpei wiped an errant tear from her cheek with his thumb and gave her the best smile he could manage. Now come on. Seven's waiting for us at the exit. But still she didn't move. Wait, before we go, there's one thing I want to ask you. What's that? What did you think when you hear the word experiment? For a moment, his mind froze. And then he came back to his senses and realized the word meant nothing to him aside from the dictionary definition. Uh, what? Oh, huh. I guess it was just a coincidence, then. I mean, that you knew about the four-leaf clover. Uh, look, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a jerk, but you're making less than no sense right now. Oh, no, 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 it's nothing. Just forget about it. Oh, don't give me that. You really think I could just drop this? What is this experiment you were talking about? Clover looked away. The four-leaf clover was still in her hand. She stared at it for a moment and then finally spoke. You promise you won't tell anyone? Cross my heart. Really? Really. I can trust you, right? Of course you can. Clover slipped the four-leaf clover into her pocket. Her eyes still red from crying as she looked up at Junpei. Okay, then. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened on the ship nine years ago. Wait, 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 wait. On this ship? Yeah, this ship. He was entirely lost. He had 1,000 questions, but it was probably best, he thought, to save them until after Clover had finished. It was an experiment to test some sort of psychic thing. Something about communicating through these fields that you can't see. Fields that you can't see? He'd heard something like this before. Clover nodded. Like, think about this. She pointed at the operating table. On top of it was a somewhat mismatched medical mannequin whose parts had been swapped with another mannequin. This is John, right? But is he really John? All Junpei could think was she has finally completely lost it. Isn't this like Loke's socks or the ship of Theseus? Junpei grew even more confused. He'd never heard of either of those things, although they sounded smart. You don't know? You haven't heard of those paradoxes? Junpei shook his head. Clover laughed. Okay, well, pay attention then. This is how Loke's socks works. 
Let's say I've got a pair of socks. They're my favorite socks. On one of them gets a hole in it. What would you do if that was your sock, Junpei? Um, there's no consequence here, so I'll just say throw it away for the sake of that. Well, I'd pitch it, I guess. But it's your favorite pair of socks. Come on, who loves their socks that much? It doesn't matter. Just suppose you do love them that much. Uh, well, then I guess I'd patch it. But what if another hole opens? I'd add another patch, I suppose. What if another hole opened after that? Um, another patch, I guess? Well, let's say that you just keep adding new patches. Until eventually, the original cloth of the sock is totally gone. Once you get to that point, can you really say they're the same socks you started with? Hmm. That's, uh... That, that's tough. Junpei crossed his arms. So, that's the low socks thing? Yeah. The ship of Theseus is a lot like it. The ship of Theseus. If you keep fixing the damaged parts of the ship, eventually it ends up with none of the parts it started with. Can you really say that the ship is the ship of Theseus that you started with? And what if you took all the old parts from the first ship and built another one somewhere else? Then which ship is the real ship of Theseus? The one you repaired? Or the one you built with all the original parts? Hmm. It was an interesting question. Clover could see Junpei was intrigued. Hey, do you think it's the same? What's the same? These guys. Is it John? Or is it Lucy now? Junpei looked at the operating table again. A mannequin full body or full of body parts from a different body. Clover had been right. It was just like the Loke socks in the ship of Theseus. The part of the body that holds a person's identity is at the head. Of course, for many hundreds of years, conventional wisdom held that the man's identity resided in his heart, or any number of internal organs. John's head and heart were both his, but apart from that and a single arm, the rest of his body had once been Lucy's. Was the mannequin really John? We're just like these mannequins. She looked at Junpei again. Think about it. The cells in our body change every day. Old ones die and new ones are born. Maybe a part of my arm is already made of stuff from a fish I ate once. Or maybe a part of your right, le right side is made from a cow you ate. If you take it a little further, those cows and fishes are made from something else too, right? That's how we're all connected. Circle of life. Anyway, through fields that the eye can't be seen with the naked eye. The silence was broken by seven. Hey, what the hell is taking you two so long? Seven's head appeared in the doorway. He was not happy. How long are you going to make me wait? We don't have enough time. We don't have time to screw around. Junpei and Clover looked at each other. Clover looked at Junpei as if to say there was more she wanted to tell him. She shook her head. Whatever she had to tell him, she didn't want to tell him in front of Seven. Seven seemed to catch on. Oh? What were you two doing? Was this some sort of secret meeting? No, it, no, it wasn't. We were just... Just... Or just? Playing. With the mannequins. Huh? Let's go, Junpei. Moving a little bit too fast to be entirely innocent, Clover headed towards the exit. Santa stared after her, then turned to Junpei with an amused expression. Playing with mannequins, huh? Didn't know you were into that kind of thing, Junpei. You're a dick. Junpei dashed past him and traced Clover's path out of the door. I don't know why, but that's like one of my favorite parts. Ellipsis. Ellipsis. You're a dick. With a short laugh, Seven followed. They stood looking at the door. Junpei look, took out the Jupiter key. All right, I'm going to open it now. Isn't that cool? You don't need to keep asking. Just do it, all right? <laughs> Fine, then. He slid the key into the keyhole and turned it. He felt it unlock. The door opened with a soft, melancholy creak. Beyond it lay a simple white hallway. There was no fanfare or confetti, and yeah, so let's skip through this stuff now. I found it! I think I already used that voice for one of these things. I found it! I don't know. I'm running out of stupid voices for that. They left the operating room. The hallway took them around several corners and past several doors, but they were all locked. Until at last, the final door was hidden in a corner of the hall. Junpei grabbed the handle. As he made to push it open, a, vo a voice stopped him. The voice came from behind him and belonged to neither Seven nor Clover. Jumpy! Or Jumpy! She spun around. Or he spun. God damn it. He spun around. He saw someone running towards him from the other end of the hallway. There were th three people coming towards Junpei and his companions. Santa, Lotus, and June! They pulled up short in front of Junpei, breathing hard. Whoa! What the hell is this? 
What are you doing here? What? But we didn't. Before he could finish, Clover spoke. Hey guys, could you come take a look at this? She was standing near the end of a small hallway that branched off to the right. The rest of them ran over to her, curious as to what she'd found. There was something on the wall at the end of the hallway. A map of the ship's interior. It said Sea Deck in the upper left corner. It was, they, they assumed, a map to the floor they were on. Door 7 and... Door 8. The map confirmed what they already knew. Both doors eventually led to the hallway where they had found themselves. In fact... Yeah, isn't that what I said? We aren't going to be split up permanently till we find door 9. We might, as, we might get separated for a little while, but we'll see each other again. Otherwise, we won't be able to open door 9. That's how the non game works. Junpei looked at the map of the ship's interior again. Eh. Adjusting, Seagan. As he looked more closely, his surprise and excitement gave way to weariness. One by one, the others saw what he'd seen. They moved as one for the door. He pulled the map of the ship's interior off the wall, put it in his pocket, and followed the others. You see, what it is that they see is that this leads back to the room they were just in. The six of them stood in front of the door, arrayed in a semicircle. Santa stepped forward. He took hold of the door and spoke without looking back at the other five. Ready? I'm going to open it. Slowly, all five nodded their silent assent. With a deep breath, Santa threw, the door, threw open the door. Excuse me. I don't know why I'm reading through all of this again. When, yeah. So, yeah, we've got the key, the Jupiter key, and shit. And there's also some other key, I think, that we got. So now we can just go back to some other place, I don't remember. There's some other doors to go get. Let's go check on room three, they say. I think it's Ace, Seven, and Clover. Yeah, Ace, Clover, and Seven, room three. Anyway, we're exploring now, so. I'm asking you if there's any reason we came back here. I have no idea. Let's go with that. You know, that's a good question. Junpei looked off into the distance thoughtfully. Lotus sighed and shook her head. I can't believe this. You guys followed me here, but you don't even know why? Junpei, you've got the solar system keys, don't you? He did. He pulled them out. The Saturn key card and the Earth key. Junpei didn't see what they had to do with anything, though. Both he and Santa were completely lost. Fortunately, June took, June took pity on them. Don't you remember the elevator? On Sea Deck, where we are now, there was, there was a big elevator behind the stairs, remember? And next to the elevator, there was a card reader with the Saturn symbol on it. And on A Deck, on the door to the left, there was a keyhole with the Earth symbol on it. I think. So the two keys that Jumpy has should let us use the elevator in the door on A deck. Huh. Yeah, that's right. June smiled, pleased with herself. So did Santa. All right, I got it. Let's get started then. What do you say we split up into two teams? Lotus and I will search the Earth one, and you two can search Saturn, all right? Sounds good. Junpei handed the Earth key to Santa. They decided that their initial search should be brief, only ten minutes. They'd meet back near the staircase once they were done. Junpei and Jude headed for the elevators. Sure enough, there was a card reader bolted to the wall next to the left elevator. He lined up the Saturn keycard and swiped it through the card reader. A light on the upper left corner blinked to life. Great. Looks like it's working now. Alright, now how do I call the elevator? There was a single button to the right of the elevator door. On the button was an upside-down triangle. The universal symbol for down. I don't know why I'm reading through all of this again. God damn it. Okay. June was probably afraid of. We've already done being locked up alone with a boy, so they could only go down. She was afraid because the only elevator button pointed down. That meant, of course, that the elevator couldn't go any higher than the floor they were on. So, okay, right. we've basically gone through all of that already. So let's do this. Push the E button. Let's go down. What did I miss? 
What's going to happen if the ceiling breaks on top? Junpei thought about that for a moment. We'd probably die. Oh no, don't be so casual about something like that. At any rate, we should probably go back. Okay. I don't know why that was so special that, you know, I had to not skip that. But anyway, there's a sixth door. Hey, where the hell did you guys go and whatnot? Snake is dead. Died just as the ninth man did. Alright, and there's the body. Eventually they reached the divider. Looked at one another and nodded slowly. For a moment, he forgot to breathe. He felt his heart collapse in his chest like an empty cigarette carton, and time froze. He knew in that instance stuff. Blood! Right. So then somebody likely killed him, is the uh, in greed census. Was Zero still on the ship with them? Of course. Let's go with. Because this has not... Uh, I've already gone through all four things that have consequence. So, I'll, the only thing left now is to go through door one, I think. It's three. There's three hours left. Alright, Mercury card reader... Let's go through there. Alright. So, we've got the voting process. That wasn't the only reason. Junpei had proposed the voting system, and he had a plan. It wasn't a plan he wanted anyone catching wind of, however, so he did his best to act as calm, and as he began to open and re read the pieces of paper. The first one read, Ace request door one. Yes, I do. Would you like me to explain why? No, we don't have time for that, sorry. Let's keep going. He opened the second one. Next is Santa. He wants door six. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Junpei continued with the third, fourth, and fifth pieces of paper. Clover wants one, Lotus wants two, and Seven also wants two. Ah? Uh, wait a minute. There's no way I'm going anywhere with the elephant, or with the elephant, man. No, there'd be no point of voting if we let people change their choices because of stuff like that. But, just give it up, Lotus. It's not like I want to hang out with some ex exhibitionist grandma. I'm not an exhibitionist. I'm wearing clothes. Barely. So, last time I checked, that's not a crime. Maybe, what about, but what about common decency? No one wants to have to look at a chick who looks like a half-naked reason. Urgh, I'm gonna kill you. Anyway, la 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 la. June wants door six. People are requested one, Ace plus Clover. People are requested two, Seven and Lotus. This was the door on the bottom deck. People who requested door six were Santa and June. It took him less than a second to run the numbers. He opened the seventh piece of paper and spoke. Okay, the last one is mine. I want to go through door one. Because that is the last necessary part. My choice is door one. Santa was unconvinced. Hey, wait a minute there. You cheating? Cheating? I'm asking if you changed your number after you heard what doors we wanted. How could I do that? I wrote it down on the paper earlier. Let me see that. Junpei shrugged and handed it to him. Santa examined it furiously. The others peered at it as well. As they did, Junpei quickly slipped the piece of paper he'd been hiding into his pocket. Although he'd never know it now, Santa had been justified in his suspicions. Junpei had switched papers. He had prepared three pieces of paper for doors 1, 2, and 6 and put the paper with door 6 on it into the pot. He put a small mark on it so we would know which one was his. He put the paper that said door 1 in his left hand and the paper that read door 2 in his right. When the drawing began, he saw to it that he drew last. The rest was easy. If he wanted to go into the door 1, he'd use his left hand, and his right hand if he wanted door 2. Of course, if he wanted door 6, that would be simple. 
All he would need to do was switch nothing and say six was what he'd wanted all along. Well, what does it say? He fought the urge to smirk. Hmm, <laughs> you got lucky. Santa snorted and tossed the paper aside, fear frustrated. <laughs> Very well, we've decided who will go through door one. It will be Clover, Junpei, and myself. Four plus one, pl one plus four plus five is ten, one plus zero is one, obviously. Our only problem is the two remaining teams. June and I want to a six. Lotus and I want to a two. That's not good. We can't open either of those doors with only two people. Fine. Seven will go through door six. Sure thing. I didn't really want to do door two anyway. Besides, if we've got a younger girl with us, it'll lower the average age. Right, June? Uh, well, I... Um... June was at a loss for words. Lotus was not. That pig. You just wait and see. Her eyes were the eyes of a woman prepared to kill. A shiver ran down June Pei's spine. Even after they separated at the staircase, Lotus was still muttering angrily to herself. Circumstances dictated that Junpei and Jun would have to part ways again, but this time it didn't sting quite so much. Let's go ahead and save here. We know what door we're going to, and we're on, on the path to it. So, until next time, peace!